welcome to Reflecting on His Word, a Bible study intended to help Christians deepen their walk with the Lord by deepening their understanding of Scripture. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. Welcome to our Bible study. This is Reflecting on His Word, and we're currently reflecting in the book of Exodus. So go ahead and open your Bible to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. I'm titling this, Who Are You? Who Are You? We'll begin in verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his own soul unto the Lord, when thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 geras. And half a shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. When they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offerings made by fire unto the Lord. So then shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed, throughout their generations. Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even two hundred and fifty shekels, and of sweet calamus, two hundred and fifty shekels, and of cassia, five hundred shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil and hen. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be an holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all his vessels, and the candlestick, and all his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels, and the laver, and his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy, whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, There shall be an holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Unto man's flesh shall it not be poor, neither shall ye make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that even in the confusing procedures of building a tabernacle and clothing the priests and mixing up anointing oil, that there's a picture here of the perfection you require. And we thank you, Lord, that you provided that perfection through your Son, through the Christ. We thank you for this. Help us as we contemplate anew these things, that we would see your glory and desire all the more to serve you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So who are you? Who are you? Well, in this passage, we're talking about the redeemed 
who may worship. And then the cleansed may worship. And then the anointed may worship. Who are you? Let's see. Verse 11, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, When you take the sum of the children of Israel, they're taking up an offering. And it says here in Scripture that this will take care of the expenses of the tabernacle. And the food has been taken care of, the fresh meat, but vegetables, uh, milk that's not offered in the, in the tabernacle for the children uh, needs to be purchased. Uh, wood for the burnt offerings needs to be purchased and brought from afar and worked. You see, the Levites were taking care of the direct work of the tabernacle, but there were a couple other families that were taking care of the peripheral work, the next layer out of the in the logistics of the tabernacle. They needed wood to do all this stuff. They needed someone to tote water. They needed water for all this stuff. They needed oil for these many things. And so some of these expenses would be covered by this atonement offering. I think it's important to point out that it was the same for rich folk as for poor folk. This is not a great amount of money, but for them to have the redemption, for them to be a part of the thing, they needed to give that money. And I think similar to the offering we take up in a, in a Baptist church, for instance, um, very often people will say, well, this supports the work of the missionaries, or this keeps the lights on, and all those things are true. But more importantly is to have our hearts properly focused on the Lord and not on the money. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And it's important for us to have our hearts right and have our hearts right when it comes to material blessings and material. And God wanted to use these things to support the tabernacle and to have the people invested in it. The priests were doing, the high priest was doing the most important work and then the priests and then those that were serving the tabernacle on the next layer of logistics out. And then the people now doing this offering are on the outer circle able to be a part of this. They're, they're being a part of it. And this is important for them. It's important for the Lord. And so these are the redeemed we speak of. So everyone that's past the age of 20 shall give that half shekel. And that half shekel be, shall be an offering to the Lord. So everyone that's 20 years old and above, the rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less. And you'll take this money and you shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle. So it's a memorial for the children of Israel for all time and eternity um, until the Christ comes. Uh, this is to make an atonement for their souls. And this was a continual need because uh, the sin that only Christ can expiate um, needed to be taken care of. Now they, by faith, looking forward to the Christ that would come, did these things by faith, but it had to be continual. They had a daily, twice a day routine for an offering. They had daily offerings and, and procedures they did. They had monthly things. They had uh, feast seasons, they had several feasts throughout the year, and they had an annual thing where the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. All these things took place, and this was a constant mill grinding out uh, these sacrifices, and it had to be done. And as you remember from our study in the book of Hebrews, that Christ was the superior sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice. He was the superior high priest, the one who could... Uh, intercede for us more perfectly. And so this is pointing to the Christ, but because the Christ had not yet come, it has to be this continual thing, a continual offering on the brazen altar. So this is the redeemed, and this is how the redeemed behave, and this is who they are. And then we go on to the cleansed. Well, who's cleansed? The Lord spoke unto Moses and said, Thou shalt make a laver of brass and his foot also of brass, and wash with all. So God is providing this brass labor for the priests to do the ceremonial washing before they go about the rest of the business. 
For the high priest, for instance, there were uh, sacrifices that had to be made. He was first consecrated as a high priest, but when he went into the Holy of Holies for the children of Israel, there were sacrifices that were made. There was cleansing that had to take place. He had to go uh, the uh, brazen altar, the brazen laver, all the, the things outside. And then he had to progress into the holy place and, and do some things there and then progress into the Holy of Holies alone and in danger. And uh, he had bells around his robe. And some say, I, I don't know that it's in Scripture. I haven't seen it in Scripture. But they say that they would tie a rope around his ankle so that if he went in unworthily, and God struck him dead, and God would strike him dead uh, if he went in unworthily, that they had this rope tied about him so they could pull his dead corpse out. Because if they charged in like paramedics to try to save his life, they too would be died. They would die because they went in unworthily. And so God is very serious about these things. These are things that need to take place. And so this washing is a part of it. Uh, those others were the redeemed. These are the cleansed, and this washing of their hands and their feet is a Christ-like cleansing indeed. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 says, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. God's word is that washing of water. Jesus is the word, and uh, this is all that picture of Christ, and that washing is that picture of being cleansed. In Christ. So this washing is necessary and this cleansing is necessary. And in verse 20, he says, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. God is deadly serious about these things. Now, I am thankful that we're not exactly under this same system. I feel called to be a minister of the gospel, um, ordained, called to serve. And I don't know if I would still be alive, if God would have struck me dead, if I ever uh, mounted the platform, stood behind a pulpit, and was not wholeheartedly into it. Now, I've strived to be, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. You see what I'm saying here? Um, I, it is my goal to never enter the pulpit unworthily. And as far as I know, I never have. But would I bet my life on it? I don't know. I mean, you think you did your taxes right. Oh, then you get a letter from the IRS. They say, there's an irregularity. We're going to have to audit you. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. And there's many a slip, twixt a cup and a lip. And it could have cost them their lives. God takes these things very, very seriously. So these are the cleansed. And this is to be uh, a statute forever for them throughout their uh, generations. And then going on to the anointed, moreover the Lord spoke unto Moses and say, take unto these principal spices and mix them with this olive oil. And, and on this recipe, a hint of olive oil and all these spices and stuff, and I'm making holy anointing oil. And this is not to be used on people. It says very clearly, not to use it on people, just on the vessels of the Lord, the various vessels of of the various furnishings of the tabernacle. It is just for that and to be used in no other fashion. And you may say, well, why they do this? Well, this is the Holy Spirit's role in all of this. In Scripture, prophetic Scripture, and in these Scriptures about the tabernacle and the temple and the sacrificial system, the oil is representative, stands for, is a type of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is so very important in all of this, for if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you do not have any of this. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, we have the story of the ten virgins. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish, and they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish ones said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. 
But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And in this is a, is a very accurate picture of how this will all flesh out with people that have the oil, the Holy Spirit, and those that do not have the oil, the Holy Spirit. Now, these virgins, they looked alike. They were undistinguishable one from the other except for the oil. And let us not make a mistake. Those that did not bring the extra oil, though they were being disobedient, they felt like they were doing the right thing, some of them. I'm sure they did. We, we know this in our churches. We have people that they attend, they show up, they're, they listen attentively to the sermon, they sing, they give a little bit of money. They're doing their thing, but if the Holy Spirit is not in them, then it's all for naught, and they will not be allowed into the wedding feast with the bridegroom. They will not be in heaven. They will not be there because they are not saved. You don't get the Holy Spirit without that salvation. So it's very important that first of all, you have the Holy Spirit. You've got to take care of that right away and do that according to scripture. Uh, the, there's an old sermon illustration that a baseball player comes to the plate, hits a home run, He's running around the bases, and when he gets to home and jumps on home plate, the umpire says, the runner's out, the runner's out, and there's an uproar, and he says, what, 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 what's the problem? He said, you never touched first base. All that trotting around and celebrating and waving to the crowd, coming up and, t and jumping on home plate does not matter because you didn't take care of the first thing. You didn't touch first base, and if we don't know Christ as our Savior, we will be locked out of that wedding feast. We will not be there. And so the Holy Spirit is vital. And that anointing oil is about the Holy Spirit. And some are big into anointing oil. Some of the charismatics um, like to have anointing oil and do some things a little differently. I don't think that's really harmful per se. But I don't feel like I need anointing oil because I have the Holy Spirit living in me. He, he's all the anointing oil I need. And that's what the anointing is about in Scripture. When we're talking about, especially we're talking about the tabernacle and what a priest is doing or what uh, people are doing with you know prophets anointing them, etc. It's about the Holy Spirit. And I have the Holy Spirit living in me because I gave myself to the Lord. I took him at his word. I answered his invitation and said, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I will do it. I gave all I know of me to all I know of him for all time and eternity. So I have the Holy Spirit living in me. So I don't need the anointing. And if you know Christ as your Savior, we don't need the anointing. So I think it's not harmful, but it's kind of a step back. It's not necessary. We have that anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not to say everything you do is perfect. Not everything I do is perfect. I feel that God has called me to the ministry. I do the very best I can to do as I ought. The Holy Spirit lives in me. He teaches me scripture and he makes all this possible. And I do the very best I can to present it in a lesson or a sermon in the way that he would have me to present the truth in scripture for you. And I feel I'm anointed for this task and I think I do okay. But I'm sure glad my life doesn't depend on it like these guys did. Their life was on the line. Of course, me disobeying my Lord is more important than this physical body and this physical life. But I want to do it all right. I want my body to stay alive and I want to serve the Lord properly. I want him to be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And the children of Israel were striving here to be faithful. And to be faithful, they had to do all of these things. And sometimes it's very complicated. There's a lot to do. And there's a lot of things where they could mess up and they need to not mess up. They need to not make a mistake. If you've ever been a, watched a video of a pilot 
preparing to fly an aircraft. They do an external inspection. They come inside and they run a checklist. There's a lot to do. All that time you're sitting like, well, we're all on the plane. Why aren't we going? Well, the pilot's running the checklist. He's making sure he's, especially if uh, he just got in this plane, he needs to make sure the guys before him didn't break it. You know, it's like you get in a rental car. You want to make sure it's all right before you take off because you don't want to be charged with the damage. And these guys run a checklist. They do an external inspection. And then they they look into the engines. They do all kinds of things. And they get on their checklist. And they run their checklist to make sure all their instruments are working properly. They want to make sure all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. And that's worth taking a little time to do. And it was certainly worth that for the priests as they ministered in the tabernacle to do these things as they ought to do. So these are the anointed ones. And then we um, continue on there in verse 28 and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels. And it's continuing the anointing of those furnishings of the tabernacle. This oil was not to be used on men. It was not to be put um, on people. And it was also not to be uh, outsiders, the unfaithful, the non-Jews that weren't brought, hadn't been brought in, the strangers, as Scripture talks about them. Uh, otherwise, if you were guilty of this, you would be cut off from your people. Pretty serious stuff. God is serious about these things. He's serious about these things because they matter. Because they paint a picture of the Christ to come. And that is so very important. You see, God has a standard, and his standard is perfection. His standard is holiness. I fall short. You fall short. Even in your very best polished up state, you think, now I'm, I'm doing pretty well as a Christian. I'm, uh, you're still not good enough, and you never will be. Only Christ is good enough. But he was good enough to offer this to us, to do this thing for us so that we could have eternal life. It's a wonderful thing. So who are you? Well, you are a whosoever. You are a whosoever. Let me explain. Psalm 15, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. So this is what yeah, this is a picture of someone who worships properly, someone who is sufficiently committed to the Lord. And that's what a whosoever will eventually do. God died for whosoever, and this is what they ought to do. David had to be right with the Lord, and you need to be right with the Lord also. Psalm 150 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. This is proper worship, and it must be done properly. We need to do these things, and God requires precision like he did with the priests, but we have much of that precision in the Christ, but he requires us to have our hearts precisely right as well, and we need to make music in our hearts for the Lord. We need to praise him in all we do. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As a whosoever, as one for whom Christ has died, this needs to be our approach to him. We need to be a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable service. This is not outlandishly great service. This is not superior superhero service. This is your reasonable service, giving all to him. 
giving all and not being conformed to this world. This is what a whosoever does. Revelation 19.10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. This is John. This is John falling before an angel. He's seeing some frightful things. And he falls before this angel to worship him. And the angel said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We need to worship God and worship no other. Our worship needs to be pure in that regard. We don't need to get caught up in personalities. There are many people that flock to some of these big churches, these big mega churches. Nothing wrong with a mega church in and of itself, but many of these are built upon a personality. These are people worshiping somebody because he's so ooh, wonderful. But look what happens to these guys when they're worshiped. Look what happens. They fall. They fall. They fall. It's important they don't be worshipped because if they're worshipped, they start to think a little bit too much of themselves and not enough of the Lord. Our worship needs to be appropriate, and that's not only good for us, but it's good for those around us. It's good for our ministers that we as whosoever's worship properly. And Amos, to the children of Israel in the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26 He's letting the people know that God's upset with them. And in their disobedience, in their rebellion, he does not accept their sacrifices. He says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down his waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and your Chion and your images, the star of your God, which you have made to yourselves. He's not accepting their worship because it's inappropriate. They're doing it in rebellion. They're worshiping things they should not worship. Things are out of order, so their worship is unacceptable. Amos is letting them know that. And it, though this is to the children of Israel, it is for us. We are grafted in and adopted. It's not addressed directly to us, but it's given to us. It's for us. So we can see what God expects in worship. And he, he expects a contrite heart. He expects uprightness. He expects things to be as they ought. He expects proper offerings and not offering the cripple and the lame and the sick. He wants our offering to be correct. He wants our worship to be correct. He wants these things to be precise because God has demands. And he meets those demands through Christ. But our attitudes need to be correct. This is for us to know how we ought to worship. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not enough to show up. It's not enough to put money in a plate. It's not enough to sing a song. It's not enough to dress appropriately. And you should dress appropriately, please. Uh, this is church. And it's not enough to do those things, do those motions. It's not enough to knock on doors. It's not enough to go to a seminar or men's advance. It's not enough to pray out loud before other people. It's not enough to pray over your meals. It's not enough to do these things. We need to worship in spirit. And in truth, we need to worship within ourselves. It needs to be a consuming thing that we do, and it needs to be honest before the Lord. We need to do it in truth, not attempting to hide things, not with a, a false uh, motivation. We need to do these things for the Lord as the Lord would have us. So how is it with you? Do you just show up and do things and your heart is not really in it? Are you worshiping God through the week, having your own personal time, a family altar? Are you reading scripture? Are you praying? Are you obeying? These are things that need to happen all week long. How is it with you? Are you worshiping properly? Are you giving all to your Lord? Maybe you don't know him yet and you need to take care of that. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one that can see this video that isn't sinful. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This whole thing is a picture of the Christ to come. And he has come. And he's come for you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.
God commendeth his love toward us, even that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, so that whosoever could call on him. And we're all whosoever. So there's, no, there's nothing that draws breath that isn't a whosoever. So how is it with you? Do you need to get it right? Do that. You need to give all you know of yourself to all you know of him for all time and eternity. It's just like marriage. Did you know everything about your spouse before you married? No. It takes a while to get to know them. But you commit to do it. And you need to commit to the Lord today if you haven't done so. You need to give all you know of you to all you know of him for all time and eternity. You need to take care of that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for this beautiful picture. We thank you that you've done this for us. You have given your son. You've given the Christ, the son of the living God, so that we could have fellowship with you. Now, Lord, help us to appreciate all you've done, to live as we ought, to sacrifice ourselves as we ought, to live for you. Thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I thank you for your kind attention as we continue reflecting in the book of Exodus. We have some exciting lessons ahead. You don't want to miss it. Some of the, the media stuff is coming further. So join us as we continue reflecting on his word. Bye now. Thank you for joining us in our Bible study. Join us again as we continue reflecting on his word.